Hey, hey weirdos. weirdos. Let's get weird. We said it at the same time. <laughs> we win! Today, um, we're sorry. This is late. For like the 13 of you that watch our show. Yeah. <laughs> we're a little we, late today. We missed, we missed Friday. Yeah. Uh, today we're going to be talking about weird conspiracy theories with uh, our favorite kind of cartoons. We only read the um, sub, the headliner for this, so we don't know all of the details. Some we know we know a little bit because we've heard we've heard this stuff talked about before. Like some of these, uh, we we know, but we haven't like read them entirely before. Yeah, we just kind of went and so. like, okay, whatever, sounds great. Uh, so we're just going to talk about them and give our opinions on them and that's what we're doing. So, so these are kind of conspiracies, but they're, they're like TV show conspiracies. Yeah, not like they're not, world conspiracies. They're not like Titanic or Obama conspiracies. Although we've read quite a few of those. Yeah, although we, we did look up quite a few of those. Yeah. Which were weird. Really weird. So... <clears throat> the first one is the fairies and fairly odd parents are metaphors for antidepressants. According to this theory, um, Timmy's fairy godparents are symbols, are simply metaphors for Zoloft and Prozac. They're there to help him through the pro his problems, but only until he feel he doesn't need him anymore. Plus, not only did they start showing up at the same time of his problems, but some of the serious side effects every time he abuses their magic. What do you think? I think it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, it's weird, it's weird. but... weird. Yeah, it's But weird, if you think but... about it, every time, like, a druggie or somebody abuses their yeah. drugs, they end up in a more serious situation, yeah. just like every time Timmy abuses his fairly godparents to get what he wants... Yeah. ...to get the outcome that he wants, he ends up in a more serious situation. So, yeah, it's... It, may, it makes sense. It's just got some, it makes some truth to it. Not one of my favorites, but it's got some truth to it. The second one is Spongebob is the seven deadly sins. Sloth, which is Patrick, who we all know is lazy. I mean, dude lives under a rock, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Honestly. Wrath is Squidward, who Definitely. is always in a bad mood and hates everybody, everything, like no matter what. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't watched Spongebob, go watch it. He never has a good day. Greed is Mr. Krabs, who's in love with money. Like, that's... Yeah, like, Mr. Money, Krabs money, money, money. Is, is all about greed, like, like penny Mr. pinches. Krabs. Like, he literally Krabs. runs after pennies. I've right. seen him do it on the TV show. Um, envious Plankton, who always uh, is envious of Mr. Krabs, and Mr. Krabs is money, yeah. and uh, even tries his own to get his own business started with a chum bucket and always fails. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever sucks. likes him as much as everybody else. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's because he's such an envious little butthead. Yeah. And he's teeny tiny. Yeah. Uh, Gluttony is Gary, the snail, who uh, wow. eats a ton. Like, you see him eat so much on the show. And then one of the every th one of the phrases you always hear SpongeBob say is, don't forget to feed Gary. Yeah. At least once At every... At least once every episode. Don't forget to feed well, Gary. Well, I wouldn't say every episode, but... He says it a lot. A lot. There was one episode where he just kept feeding him nonstop when he was trying to get the special kind of food or whatever, and it was like basically crack for snails, and he wouldn't stop eating it. Drug abuse, more drug abuse. Basically, Pride is Sandy, who's proud. She's always proud Texan because it said in the series that she's from Texas because she's a squirrel, and she's super um, prideful of like all of her accomplishments scientifically. Yeah. And she kind of... Which makes sense. And, and and the other thing that isn't said in here but I thought about is the fact that she always is talking about um, how dumb Patrick is. Like, um, one of her questions to him is, um, don't you have to be dumb somewhere else? And he's like, not till four. <laughs> and so, like, she's always making fun of him yeah. being stupid. Yeah. Lust uh, is Spongebob, who is overly friendly with everybody he ever meets in like his entire life yeah. and loves everyone and wants to love everyone even when people hate it like yeah, like he is Squidward kind of... like Squidward like he never leaves Squidward yeah, alone. he is kind of creepy in that aspect. if you think about it Spongebob's really a douche 
he really, he's a jerk. Like, yeah. no matter, like, he's destroyed Squidward's house so many times, and he's like, that's okay, Squidward, it'll be fine. Like, no, you just yeah. destroyed my house. Like, my yeah. house is gone. <laughs> he never leaves yeah. him alone. The kids from Magic School Bus grow up to be the kids from Captain Planet. Now, if you guys want to go check this out, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because the, if you look at the pictures side by side, they look exactly like yeah. the kids. Like, I don't know if the animators were the exact same for both shows, or if it was an accident, but I don't think it's a coincidence, honestly. <laughs> so, the theory is, I'm, and I haven't read this one, so I'm glancing over it. Um, the theory is, is that Miss uh, Frizzle um, kidnaps the kids... Relocates them to an island where she brainwashes them and thinking they were in school and she's the teacher. In reality, this was an indoctrination camp, um, indoctrination camp, whatever, uh, where she created the perfect pollution fighters by instilling a love of science and ecology in them at a young age. Not all the kids made the cut. Phoebe resisted the brainwashing, unable to forget her previous life and constantly making references to her old school. It was a pathetic cry for help, and in an attempt to hold on to her last shred of sanity... This is sad. Yeah. Uh, Ralphie fell under Janet's spell, and the two escaped the island, only to be driven mad by their memories. Eventually, they turned to a life of crime, becoming hoggishly greedy... Oh, hoggish... Yeah, greedy, and, um, Dr. Blight, the mysterious time-dilating effects of... Gaia's Island, which is the island they were on, accounts for their discrepancies in age. Um, Keisha or Kesha's current whereabouts are unknown. When her class had matured sufficiently, Frieza slash Gaia wiped their memories and sent them out as equal friendly sleeper cell until she needed them. Years later, she gave them the power rings and sent, sent them off on an ecological series of adventures. That's really messed up. Yeah, I mean, if you don't, if you haven't watched, I have not watched Captain Planet in ages, so some of that went right over my Captain head. Planet. But ah, oh, Captain Planet. That's really strange. Like, I mean, she she had good intentions. Like, we're gonna save the planet, but eco friendly. But I'm gonna have brainwashed children. I'm kidnapping the, you and kidnapping brainwashing you. Kidnapping and brainwashing you. children in the process. I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah. Guys. As much as I want to save our planet, I I mean they're. That's gotta scary. be a better way than that. <laughs> the next one we're gonna talk about is the uh, Rugrats, the dead baby theory, which is creepy. This one has a lot of, a lot of. I mean, I have. I don't it. think I've read it yet. No, I haven't read it yet. But it does sound very creepy. Okay. We all know Angelica is a little nutty, but the Rugrats theory takes it to a whole new level. Get this: the Rugrats really were a figment of Angelica's. Um, imagination. Chucky died a long time ago along with his mother. That's why Chaz is a nervous wreck all the time. Tommy was a stillborn. That's why Stu is constantly in the basement making toys for the son who, had, who never had a chance to live. That's so sad. The DeVilles had an abortion. Angelica couldn't figure out whether it would be a boy or a girl, thus creating the twins. Okay, well, po potentially explains well, that potentially explains why Angelica can speak to both adults and the babies. We're still not entirely convinced. What about Susie? Which Susie is the little black girl. It does explain her, but it definitely explains the rest of them. Yeah. Especially with uh, Phil and Lil. What if Susie is supposed to be, like, real life? Because she's like, she's, like, super smart, and she's always, like... Not that she tells Angelica off, but she's always, like, stop picking on them or whatever. She's kind of, like, the one who stands up to them all the time. Yeah, but the only problem is, is if Susie can see them... And they're real. That's true. But what if um, Susie is like... What if Susie was her best friend who got killed and now she sees her? Maybe. To me, to me, I think Susie would be like reality. Like her conscious, conscience. Yeah. Like a reality check or Maybe it's her. trying to break it like maybe. these aren't real kind of thing. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. That'd be weird. Yeah, it doesn't... It doesn't really... Uh, this one's a bit wordy. Yeah, this one's really long. The Purgatory Theory for Ed, Ed, and Eddie. This theory po post... See, here I go. Now I'm stuttering. <laughs> this theory sits on the possibility on whether or not the kids that inhabited the cul-de-sac 
are actually Toady more dead. Probably between death. I don't know what that means. Purgatory, well, purgatory is between death, so. Toady, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like it. And that the cul-de-sac in which they reside in actually takes place in a purgatory-like setting. This theory points to facts such as the children's green slash blue tongues. The tongue does in fact turn a blue shade when you die. The lack of adults or even other children, the endless summer in the earlier seasons, unusual human cap a whole world. According to the theory, the children of the early 2000s. 2000s. This theory also explains why the year for the show is very hard to pinpoint and also explains the answer as to why there aren't any adults in the show, even though you do usually catch a glimpse of one every now and then. According to the theory, Rolf came first in the 1900s. His family had moved to Peach Creek in order to establish a farm on its land. Rolf died in 1903 when his father's, farms and father's farm animals stampeded and trampled him. This was the supposed reason as to why he only, he only has one cow, one goat, a few pigs, and a few chickens. Not enough animals to cause a fatal stampede in the afterlife. That makes a lot of sense. I was just thinking about that. I'm like, yeah, why does he only have one of everything? Yeah. I only ever see him with the one cow and the one goat. I don't yeah, think I've ever I don't seen think him. No, I've else. seen him with a few. I've seen him with a few of the chickens. Yeah, where but that's like, that's all he has. Or something. Yeah. That's I don't remember. No, I only remember seeing him with one pig, actually. Did he have a pig? Yeah, he did have yeah. a pig, but I've seen him with a goat because he had him tied up with yeah. a rope. I remember that. was that. a weird episode. Although, most of it in the episodes are weird. But I it is weird. Yeah, okay. Johnny 2 by 4 came next to the cul-de-sac not too long after Rolf's death. Having no friends, Johnny took a marker and drew a face on a piece of wood and dubbed it Plank. He died in 1922 after fighting a long battle with tuberculosis. That's sad. He took his friend Plank with him in the afterlife since he was the last thing that he saw in life before he died. That's really sad. But that also explains why he never lets go of Plank. Like, yeah, that's dude true. will not like, get rid of that Plank. That's It's a piece of wood. Yeah. Like, seriously. Um, Eddie came next. He was born in New York, but eventually moved to Peach Creek during the Great Depression era. Always trying to get a quick buck, he always set up scams to get money from the cul-de-sac. But the kids... Wait. From the cul-de-sac. Cul-de-sac kids, but the kids never knew it was... Never knew Eddie didn't have a proper father figure since his real father abandoned him and his mother shortly after he was born with... With this came the big bro he adored and idolized so very much. Yeah, I don't know whoever wrote this, but they, no offense to them, but complete your sentences. <laughs> Sorry. Just read it. I'm a grammar Nazi. You're weird. Uh, after one of his scams went awry, Eddie was chased by the swindled children of the cul-de-sac and ran to the lake and jumped into it. Eddie ends up drowning in that lake, and he soon joined the other deceased children in the afterlife. Ew, that, that sounded weird. Mm. Yeah. Even though he's no longer alive, Eddie still tried to chase after the almighty dollar by continuing his swindle, swindling nature in the afterlife. I don't know, that one sounds weird. Yeah, but it kind of makes sense, though, because Eddie, no matter what, always yeah, he's, going he's for always that He's always like, dollar. there's money. Right. And they always spend it on jawbreakers. Like, yeah, but if you such, think... They're such kids. But no, 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 but if you think about that, jawbreaker is food, so if you did grow up in the Great Depression era, there would have been a, a loss of food. Yeah. True. And what better than jawbreakers for kids for food? True. True. Okay. Next is Ed and Sarah. Their father had died fighting in World War II, and as a result, their mother became distant and disconnected. To try and compensate, Sarah developed her bossy attitude, trying to fill the role their mother and father used to fill before their father died and their mother stopped caring. Ed, however, shut the world out and developed into the fancy worlds of comic books and monster movies in order to escape his unhappy life. They both died in a free car accident in 1953, thus joining the, kid, the past kids in death. I agree with that one totally because... That Sarah... sounds like... I don't know, it just sounds weird. Like, the other ones made sense. Like, their deaths, like, coincided with what goes on. In well, yeah, but, I mean, you can't like, always... This one's just kind of like, well, they just died in a car accident another day. I'm done. <laughs> You also never see them in a car, though. True. Although, I don't think you see anybody in cars in that show. 
Correct us if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody. I don't think I've. I, I don't remember seeing anybody. I think anybody you in see cars. cars. Yeah, but I don't think you see anybody in. No, cars. I know. I think, but I think you see them. But I don't. Think... Like, like once or twice, maybe. Yeah, but. I don't remember. Like I don't remember seeing cars that much. Yeah. But it makes sense, um, especially with Ed, because then he just delves into a different fantasy world to get away from everything. Yeah. Naz was born in the 60s era to hippie parents. Described as a flower child, she was rather flirtatious. She was a rather flirtatious young girl who would always act the, that way towards the male children of the neighborhood. In the summer of 79, a serial killer escaped from a local asylum, made his way into her house, and raped and murdered her along with her entire family. Because this event was so traumatizing, Naz, like Ed, shut the world out when she entered into purgatory, and this also explains why she's not shown working around the house like the other children often would. It makes sense about Naz, because she's yeah. super laid back, and she definitely is flirtatious, and you never see her by her own house. You see her with yeah, you see, at Kevin's house. Yeah, you see her at other people's houses, but you never see her at her own house. Correct us if we're wrong if, on anything, but... I mean, I don't... I mean, I don't I haven't, I haven't, haven't seen had it them memorize time, the show, but I don't remember seeing it like, oh, this is my house, you know. What are you doing in my room or something like that? Yeah, but you totally see that all the time with Eddie. Yeah. Okay. Ed, mostly. Next is Double D. Double D was born in the '80s time period, which is around the time that technology is advancing, and was raised by very strict and controlling parents. 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 Parents who pushed him to both succeed academically and to be perfectly cleaned and neat. He is believed to have died as a result of a gas leak causing an explosion with the Bunsen burner from his current chemistry set. I believe that. The only thing that I had to disagree with that is there was a couple episodes where um, you see not his parents but you see that they leave him notes. Like uh, there, the one the one was uh, something about in the kitchen there's dinner in here or something. So like there are notes that suggest that he has parents. Hmm. Granted, he could have wrote those notes himself to make him feel better. Yeah. I mean... I don't know. Yeah, I'm not... I'm, I mean, it totally makes sense, though, because he's a complete nerd. It could, it could be that they groomed him to be, like, super neat and smart. And tidy and... And remembered. then when they... When they... Um, but, like, they weren't there that often. Maybe they both worked or something. Yeah, and maybe. they would leave him notes and stuff. And so he just kept it on in the afterlife. It's totally, totally plausible. Know. Okay, next is Kevin. Kevin was born the day Double D died. He was born to a broken down house, and he also had an abusive father who was poorly educated, and his mother had passed away when he was a year old. Because of his situation at home, Kevin would act his frustration out on the other children of the cul-de-sac, becoming a bully as a result to cope with his pain. One night in the winter of 99, his father fatally beat him in a fit of drunken rage, and he died while he was on his way to the hospital. His father was then convicted of his murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. When Kevin entered into the afterlife, he reimagined his father as loving and that he would shower him with gifts. He still kept his bullying ways in the afterlife, though. Which makes sense. It does make sense, because most bullies end up having really yeah, bad homes. Yeah, most, most bullies end up... Like, I'm gonna say, like, 99.9% .9 of the time, most bullies grow up in a house where... Either their siblings or their parents or their uncles or their aunts or some some sort of family member bullies them first and then they hash Just, it out on other people. Yeah, because they don't know how else to deal with it. Yeah, it makes sense. So. Okay, Jimmy. Jimmy was the last kid to enter the cul de sac. He was born in the 2000s and was diagnosed with leukemia. He was never associated with himself, associated himself with the other cul de children because his parents believed he was too frail to be around the other kids, and he remained bedridden for the remainder of his life because of this fact. After fighting a long, difficult battle with his leukemia, Jimmy eventually succumbed to his illness, and soon the cul de purgatory was complete. That totally makes sense because it, all throughout the, the series, he's like this very feminine... I don't want to touch this. Oh my God, there's bacteria. Yeah. I don't want to get it makes in the way. A lot of sense. And then he ends up being friends with Sarah because Sarah is a mother figure. Yeah, she's very protective. And yeah. protects him and yeah. he doesn't get hurt when she's around. Yeah. Because she'll beat the crap out of anybody who tries. Basically, yeah. She's basically you. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> 
Last one. The last one. The Kankers. The Kanker Sisters. I don't remember the Kanker Sisters. Oh, oh yes, she, I do. The Kanker okay. Sisters are the three that yeah, are the always sisters. chasing after Ed and Eddie. Yeah. The weird... Ugh. Oh. There's a whole theory on so, them, too. Yeah. Um, they were different from the other neighborhood children, apparently. It is believed that they are actually demons that sent that were sent to the cul-de-sac to torment the souls of the remaining <laughs> children who didn't cross over to heaven. The Kankers... <laughs> one, in the middle of this paragraph, in parentheses, are just, Hi! Hi! Like, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but like, in the middle of this paragraph, can you see it? It's yeah, just, yeah. Hi! Hi! In the middle of this paragraph. <laughs> Alright, moving on. The Kankers are the only characters with normal colored tongues, which would seem to indicate that they are not dead, and that, therefore, they must be something different. Surprisingly, the, can- the Kankers are attracted to the Eds for unknown reasons. However, the common guess is that they are the weakest willed children of the cold sack, or because they each symbolize a certain deadly sin. Which makes sense. Well, Eddie would be greed. Ed would be sloth. Double- what would Double D be? Pride? Because he's so proud of the scientific stuff. And he's always. Well, what are the seven deadly sloths. sins? Actually, you know what? Um, on top of that, uh,. On top of sloth for or, uh, for Ed, you could throw in um, gluttony as well because yeah. he eats everything in sight. That's me. Mm-hmm. Me too. Food. <laughs> Food. Yeah, I guess he would be considered pride and maybe sloth because he doesn't he doesn't want to do the things that Ed. Yeah, he kind of just so. like. He's just kind of like we have to go. <laughs> yeah. And then also the other thing. Um, about Kevin is that he rides his bike all around town as an escape like, yeah. to get away. Yeah. So that was all the weird stuff that we found out. Oh, uh, paper drop. <laughs> we hope you liked this nonsense. Um, Subscribe to our channel for more. If you have anything else that you want us to read or look up or talk about, comment it down below. Thanks for watching. See y'all in the next video. Bye-bye.